I'll begin with a few preliminary statements. Uh, so this is a creative project uh, as well as an experimental project, this whole piece. And um, I'm not attempting an analytically rigorous conceptualization of emotionality, but rather the attempt is to point towards aspects of emotionality of a possible alternate mode of learning. And in that note, I'd um, add an addendum or I'd change my title a little from knowledge as emotion to knowing as emotionality and subtitle non-linguistic modes of learning. So um, a lot of my paper has, yeah. um, so I start with this quote from Maslow because I was looking at forms of knowing and knowledge which uh, have a great deal to do with how we learn things informally and uh, they do not make use of language as deployed conventionally in education. So this is my thrust to step off into this. So if one thinks in terms of developing the kinds of wisdom, the kinds of understanding, the kind of life skills that we would want, then he must think in terms of what I would like to call intrinsic education, intrinsic learning. That is learning to be a human being in general, and second, learning to be this particular human being. So my idea of an approach geared to this end hopes not to construe uh, the learner as a blank repository into which data or information can be transmitted, but rather chooses to return to the basics, to those drives that we can claim to be inherent both collectively and individually in all human beings, to those very undercurrents that seem to, in the first place, frame a variety of capacities and capabilities that we exercise and lay claim to as contemporary human beings. Such an exercise is felt necessary not because of the existence of a dominant conceptualization of students as blank repositories, but rather because of certain tendencies that manifest in the practices of contemporary schools and colleges in framing the curriculum and associated pedagogy. Uh, working within severe time constraint and under the coercive influence of result-driven audit cultures, education has th and thus learning seem to be veering into a limiting exercise of transmitting a set of packaged deliverables in an abstract manner. The urge to break away from this dominant approach in conceptualizing about humans in general and human learning in particular is motivated by recent transformations in the field of psychology. These transformations are characterized by a move away from the pathological and behavior, behavioral as foundational to psychology and towards a most positive psychology that emphasizes self-actualization of human beings as a vital characteristic of our species. The sociologist John F. Glass grounds this claim when he states that man's search for meaning by himself and for himself is not very successful can be attested to by any psychotherapist. Drawing once again upon Maslow, Glass proceeds to contextualize such knowledge as residing in the relations to others and within a community. Our contemporary age, which is characterized by notions of innovation, development, progress, seem to have no place for a knowledge which is based on a notion of self-actualization and yet grounded in the dynamics of a community. For under the current regime of freedom, even self-actualization seems to be a category open to a series of progressive developments that match our technological prowess. So the famous mathematician Michael Polanyi in his book Personal Knowledge traces the origin of such a movement back to the pioneering discovery of Copernic Copernicus when he asks, I quote, what is the true lesson of the Copernican revolution? Why did Copernicus, Copernicus exchange his actual terrestrial station for an imaginary solar standpoint? The only justification for this lay in the greater intellectual satisfaction he derived from the celestial pan panorama as seen from the sun instead of the earth. Copernicus gave preference to man's delight in abstract theory at the price of rejecting the evidence of our senses which present us with the irresistible fact of the sun, the moon, and the stars rising daily in the east and travel across the sky towards the setting in the west. In a literal sense, therefore, the new Copernican system was as anthropocentric as the Ptolemaic view, 
the difference being merely, merely that it preferred to satisfy a different human affection. So what seems to have been lost in this transition between the two different subject positions is the richness of everyday human experience, a sensual experience that is nested in between the interface of the human body and the body of nature an experience that has been time and again relegated to the so-called crudities of a more basic propensities of everyday life. Yet without these experiences, let alone survival, one is robbed of the basic richness of being a human being. Paradigmatic of an explanation in this direction would be to posit an equally confounding, I feel therefore I am, in subversion of the infamous or famous Cartesian maxim, I think therefore I am. Crucial to treading such a path is the necessity to drop our categorical gaze of approaching, uh, approaching learning as driven by facts or concepts and replacing it by a gaze that acknowledges a feeling of relatedness or a plurality of beings. A gaze that not only acknowledges the presence and connectedness of others, but also acknowledges the experience of otherness as being destructive of individuality and of generalizing human values. An urge for such a revision in our ways of seeing can be found in the works of Dillard, Tulman, Keller, and Whitehead. My next section explores this idea. Uh, from the perspective of the experience of art, and it illustrates a case study for an alternative mode of knowing. In brief, one can construe a non-linguistic mode of learning as being grounded in our emotions. Such a move does not necessarily discount the skill or ability of, for example, drawing in itself, but rather contextualizes such a skill within the larger economy of our emotional lives. In this sense, the ability to skill or draw, sketch or paint suggests how processes of learning necessarily involve non-cognitive aspects that are often beyond the cognitive task at hand. Such a characterization acknowledges, as we shall see, the tacit and seemingly invisible being of such aspects of learning. Approaching learning in such a fashion allows for us to do justice to a wide spectrum of human activities and practices that accentuate myriad, the myriad modes in which we learn about ourselves, the world and our place in it. An example of such a mode of learning can be found in the domain of art appreciation, the contours of which we shall briefly sketch in an exploration of notions of silence in the work of the famous Dutch artist Johannes Vermeer. Painting here is explored as a form of art and a system of representation that allows for a recourse from the linguistic by virtue of its relative lack of commensurability with the format of our collective social life, which seems to be grounded in natural language. This lack of commensurability invokes in the audience a necessity to consider works of art under the context in which they are generated. The blank canvas, therefore, should be understood as yielding to layers of context that are imposed by the artist. In taking into consideration what is characteristic of human beings, Bath goes further than Wolf to say that not only artworks, but also viewers are layers of context yoked together. In order to address the manner in which this engagement occurs between context, cultural, and other that are embodied in humans as well in works of arts, Bath proposes two terms, studium and its corollary punctum. Conceived by Bath, these two terms provide us with a significant method for approaching the process of knowing that underwrites the legibility of works of art. So in the context of these paintings, Wiseman introduces two different perspectives that uses the, term, uh, the terms studium and punctum to interpret Vermeer's work. The first per perspective focuses on the inaccess inaccessibility of the con cultural context of these paintings, while the second perspective celebrates the particularity of each painting. A characteristic of subjects in Vermeer's painting is their refusal to yield to interpretation. I quote, in this they are like the contents of the unconscious mind, primitive in being untouched by culture and its systems of intelligibility. The first perspective that Weissman considers in relation to what Professor Wolf uh, is the relation that Professor Wolf draws between the paintings and the economic, political, and intellectual undercurrents of Vermeer's milieu, and the necessity to establish continuity between these disparate elements through alternate means. Wolf seems to achieve this theoretically by situating both writing and painting uh, on a common platform, and then acknowledging the applicability of illegibility to both these categories. Uh, he then invokes the idea of the punctum as a means to present to the audience the contextual that which is in the unconscious and evasive of natural languages. 
Gaskell, on the other hand, is interested in the particularity of Vermeer's paintings and focuses on the painting "Woman Standing at a Virginal." For him, the modality, modality of uh, for him, the modality of understanding complex pictorial abstractions parallels the modality of love. He invokes the concept of love to highlight the mode through which the visual medium instantly impresses upon the heart or spirit of the audience. This approach can be characterized as dispensing great faith in the direct visual apprehension of the objects in his paintings as representations of themselves. Such an approach is characteristic in undermining the role of the symbolic in works of art. Gaskell suggests that the cultural context or studium of a work of art is overcome as the punctum operates in a manner. I quote: "As the punctum operates in a manner of love and in silence." Weismann's own analysis claims that the challenge is not in being able to imagine what lies in the consciousness of the subject, for this would only amount to a mere projection of the viewer's imagination. Rather, the presentness of the subjects in Vermeer, Vermeer's paintings serve to indicate that they have a life and identity that is characteristically different from ours. In light of this self-containment of the subjects, Weismann prompts us to bow before the, for for us to, I quote, bow before the utter differentness of others from ourselves. A difference that coexists with the reality, theirs that, like ours, knows no reserve. In the sense, the life of their own that we attribute to the subjects is not a metaphoric con construction; rather, the credit attributed to Vermeer seems to stem from the fact that his subjects stand before us like other persons, whose presence one has to, in whose presence one has to bear witness. And I quote again: "Credit to the paintings alone is due for teaching their viewers that silence." that the silence that attends to them is a sign of recognition that there are other minds than us following the discussion so far prepares us once again to ask the question what is non linguistic mode of learning in art as discussed earlier the lack of commensurability between the linguistic forms of representation and the form of representation of art seems to provide us with a direction to proceed in such a lack of commensurability is made legible here on the basis of the presumed self possession and self containment in the paintings of vermeer Weismann concludes that the silence in a work of art is that which helps an individual acknowledge the plurality of existence in a spontaneous manner. Uh, Gaskell, on the other hand, is seeing dabbling with notions of the subject's historicity. The silence in the paintings results from what he conceives as a gamble on Vermeer's part, a gamble that assumed that viewers would directly apprehend the objects in his paintings in a mode similar to that of love. the relation to the emotion love that is made here and that we have discussed earlier in relation to the notions of studium and punctum seem to indicate that the non linguistic mode of learning as facilitated by works of art as being radically different from notions of syntactic reason logic or any such set of structured linkages that are associated with the cognitive processes that we often associated with associate with forms of proportional knowledge on the other hand wolf is seen trying to relate the works of art to the milieu of the time he seems to be drawn to the process by which the private observations of the artist manifest in a work of art which is public for him the art of vermeer seems to convey a message that pays tribute to the life of an interior world the link that he brings to the, uh, brings to light here is the unique style that characterizes vermeer's presentation of this internal world of the subject characteristic of this presentation is the manner in which the viewer is offered only a token appearance of the subject's interiority as the rest of the interiority is engulfed in silence so wolf gaskell and weismann are thus seen using three different perspectives in articulating the notion of silence in experience in the experience of art which for our purposes catch out a brief contour of a non linguistic mode of learning they all seem to be pointing towards the contours of an entity that can be perceived from a variety of perspectives they posit the related concepts of presence otherness and interiority as some of the qualities that allude to the non linguistic elements in the visual medium a medium that by virtue of its nature is not directly commensurable with natural language this is the common link that all three share through is the ability of the visual artistic medium to present things in a manner that cannot be rivaled or conceived of by the linguistic medium it is to this ability of art to appeal instantly to the non cognitive to that which resides in the recesses of language and yet animates it dynamically that one discovers the contours of a non linguistic mode of learning i'm quickly moving to our next section which is cultural strategies of learning again non linguistic modes while the above foray into the world of art has provided us with glimpses of the non linguistic modality as associated with notions of otherness presence and interiority an analysis of the practice of certain american indian communities provides us with a cultural and situated understanding of the non linguistic mode as a valid means of approaching the domain of personal knowledge in to give it up 
to give up on words silence in western apache culture keith h basso uses social linguistics and ethno science to introduce to us certain non linguistic aspects of behavior among the western apache of cbq in the fort apache indian reservation in central arizona the study presents a number of situations where american indians are seen to be deliberately refraining from involving in conversation the description of this contextual practices are complemented by discussion on the american indian interpretation and encouragement of such practices so uh, these are the one two, six uh, categories that is described and uh, these are cultural specific modes of social interaction in which silence is defined as an appropriate with respect to specific individual or individuals so in the first context we see that the apache are often very distrustful of strangers who engage in conversation too quickly such individu individuals are believed to hold utilitarian motives or considered intoxicated the ethnographic material that basso ba basso presents describes an incident where an apache from one settlement avoids speech from an apache from another settlement for two whole days when they were working together uh, at another place at a third place and they start speaking only after a sustained period of careful observation after which one of them acknowledges the conduct of the other as acceptable so in the case of courting we see a similar context of unfamiliarity during which young men and women are often observed refraining from the use of spoken language in public and private settings of early courtship girls are often warned by their mothers and sisters of the perceived slight in virtue among girls who spoke freely with boys during courtship some of these young men too are seen as exhibiting intense shyness self consciousness unfamiliarity and not knowing what to say or do as some of the reasons for keeping mum uh, the third one children coming home offers another interesting manifestation of refraining from the use of language in dictating familial relations here both the parents avoid speaking with those children who have been away from home for a long time especially going to board boarding school while the children do express their experiences freely parents listen attentively and only begin to converse after a couple of days as a mode of re reorientation this response may be baffling to us but for the apache parents it represents i quote the concerns that they have acquired new ideas and expectations which will alter their behavior in predictable ways uh, getting cursed out is another context that plays out in a wide range of locations from houses trading posts ceremonial dancing grounds to any place in which an individual can get angry and go on a rant though often associated with drinking parties getting cursed out is not limited to such situations the non linguistic engagement maintained in such situations takes cognizance of the enraged uh, that the party is enraged is crazy or in an irrational state of mind such an engagement may be characterized as an emotional strategy to avoid i quote to avoid any action that will attract the attention to oneself and the last one is uh, in being with people who are sad one maintains decorum while visiting friends or relatives who have lost a loved one such an engagement is not related to the immediate burial period but verbal disengagement manifests over the next couple of weeks until the person is believed to have recovered from his or her grief such a policy seems to acknowledge the difficulty of these individuals to engage in normal conversation secondly it acknowledges the pointlessness in verbalizing concerns during a period of irreplaceable grief and finally it connects grief to anger hostility hostility and possible physical violence pointing to the at the instability of the self during such times and in the last scenario being with someone for whom they si sing which is bound up with temporal and physical locations due to their status as curing ceremonies set in accordance to the seasons these rituals are held either at ceremonial dancing grounds or at the home of the sick individual during these ceremonies only the medicine man is allowed to speak to the individual verbal communication by others is restricted because the party is undergoing ceremonial treatment are perceived as having been changed by power into something different from their normal selves they are regarded with caution and apprehension so uh, these are a set of categories but then i also want to look at something in the indian context so i'm going to uh, insert that in so in in close relation to what we have come across earlier as a disregard for the categorical gaze that only straddles certain formal cognitive processes these six events describe alternative methods that not only identify the ambiguous or unpredictable relations between human beings but also proceeds to suggest that non linguistic modes in which these concerns are resolved are not contingent upon the situation itself but upon the ambiguous emotional status of the individual or individuals in the situation uh, this is the example that we will see later in the indian context as well uh, this is why the phenomena of courtship uh, and as well as the other phenomena of being in the vicinity of a stranger um, 
and Basso recounts here, I quote, an individual's decision to speak may be directly contingent upon the character of his surroundings. So this body of evidence is suggestive of alternative conceptualizations of modes of knowing in which individuals or groups deploy observation and other tacit processes over and above the uses of dialogue in mediating process of personal knowing. The famous American child psychiatrist Robert Coles introduced Kierkegaard's observation in the present age to drive home a point about talkativeness as resulting from the fall of grace of the distinction between talking and keeping silent, a distinction that he feels is crucial today, especially, I quote him, when the hallmark of our time seems to be a lot of psychological chatter, lots of self-consciousness and lots of interpretations. So the Indian sociologist Veena Das provides us with a similar form of learning in the Indian context. In her essay titled The Voices of Children, she touches upon such learning when she describes the forms of relationship between mother and, uh, mother and child encountered while conducting her fieldwork among urban Punjabi families in Delhi. A particular episode she narrates of a widowed woman Sarla and her son Shankar staying with her brother's family is particularly in insightful. Das narrates a typical dinner scenario where the brother and his children along with Shankar are sitting on the floor to eat food. Both the women are working in the kitchen, Sarla serving ho hot rotis at his, as it is being pulled out of the pan while her sister-in-law is seen cooking them. As Sarla serves the bread and the, the brother's children are seen voicing their rights toward a share of the hot bread, Sarla's son Shankar too would participate in this process but would time and again be passed over by his mother until he began to whine. At this point, Sarla's brother steps in, admonishes her and proceeds to serve Shankar a roti out of his own plate. Uh, das analyzes this indifference on the part of the mother as a communicative strategy in which her status as a dependent in her brother's family is being play or played out. She claims that such a move puts the onus of taking an interest in the child upon other members of the family. Sarla in this context is not to be read as a cold, indifferent mother, but rather her passivity should be seen as that which provides the other family members with an invitation to care for her child. The social structure of the family was thus dramatically displayed to the child at mealtimes every day. Both these contexts of learning in Apache Indian culture are closely associated with what we have uh, Maslow's notions of learning to be a human being in general and in particular. Learning as captured by these two cultural contexts, though mediated by the immediate, do not seem to inhere, inhere in the immediate. In this sense, both Sarla as well as the parents of the American Indian children who were returning from school uh, could have been direct in their articulation of their concerns. Yet we see in this context that the immediate is experienced as merely a site of mediation that takes into consideration certain other aspects of the process of knowing, such as an affective sensitivity that lies beyond a merely cognitive treatment of the matter. In such an approach to learning, we see that learning is not merely limited to the elements that participate in such a mode of learning, but rather extends to involve various other aspects, including aspects such as the emotional that are often absent from mainstream cognitive descriptions of learning. Uh, thus, in both these treatments of the theme of learning, we see emerge an alternative epistemology of learning. Learning in this context seems not to be associated with the mastery of certain symbolic processes and methods that formal disciplines hold sacred, but rather point towards those inherent qualities that emerge in human interaction with its environment and others. Knowledge of this form seems to be associated with our emotions, something that does not seem to have much space within the contemporary epistemic dom domain of knowledge and knowing. Now I'm going to go back to my experiences to, for my next section. Uh, growing up in a small town and experiencing a localized mediation of knowing and being, the move to a bigger city for education set into view a conflict of values that highlights some aspects of the contemporary approach towards life. Among the more powerful feelings that I felt when I made this uh, transition as an 18 year old was a deep sense of loss, a feeling of unfamiliarity and a sense of loss of self a sense of self that till now had been fostered by its association with the people and the places that had foregrounded my sense of being both a particular human being and one in general. Agnes Heller in her definitions of the, uh, definition of the essence of modernity provides a way of making sense of this feeling that I had experienced. She claims that modernity has no foundation since it emerged in and through the deconstruction of all foundations. In other words, modernity is founded on freedom. Heller then pr proceeds to indicate how this foundation of freedom is unfit to serve as a foundation. She inv invokes both Heidegger and Hegel in claiming that this ground is rather like an abyss because it is a foundation that does not found, but rather simulates continuous reinvention. Thus the newly wrought notions of truth, good and justice serve to displace all existing norms which had in the past set the limit, scope and form of human knowledge and interrogation. 
As abstract as Heller's definition may sound and as confounding as these new notions of truth, good and justice might seem, it allows us to unpack an interesting trajectory in the paradigm of individual development today. So we can proceed by taking recourse to the continuous re reinvention that such a modernity enforces. At the foundation of such an inquiry is the individual who in the name of freedom is albeit unwit un unwitting unwittingly directed onto a trajectory of educational and vocational progress that expects him or her to frame the self and its relations with others in a quarantined fashion. This stripping away of the emotional being from the locality of his or her affective ties in order to accommodate a disinterested, dis a detached being is, a much, is much valued both by the academy and industry and is paradigmatic of, current, of the contemporary trajectory of an individual development. So here I quote uh, Norman Denzin, uh, where he claims that emotionality arises out of inhibited, interpreted social acts in which the subject inserts self-conversations between the perception of experience and the organization of action. In these conversations, feelings directed to the self mediate action and interpretation. And thus, emotionality becomes a social act lodged in a social situation. Examples that illustrate the various nu nuances of this phenomena abound, and I myself am guilty of being part to it. For while pursuing my postgraduate degree in philosophy, I used to live with a friend who was pursuing his degree in journalism. A feature of our educational training that used to come up in our discussion was the often, often was the perceived lack of rigor in the journalism course as compared to the philosophy course. And um, I, as, as I had far more reading to do and assignments to submit, there was a certain intellectual distance that I used to articulate towards my friend on, the, on this basis. Though at the face of the matter, such an emotional disposition seems trivial, Denzin claims, I quote, that it consists of structures of behavior, movements, mannerisms, gestures, and feelings that are uniquely the person's. So we can understand such positions as articulating the process of knowledge production if we consider it from the perspective of rarity as an endless search for consensus rather than an endless search for truth. In their essay regarding the politics of knowledge production, Moreria and Diversi thus take a claim for what they conceive as a visceral knowledge. They claim that this knowledge does not reside in the book or brain, but rather in the lived body. The ability to walk through the slums at ease, the ability to interact with soccer fans, and sugarcane workers are all considered as representative of such a form of knowledge. Uh, understanding emotionality in this way directs our gaze towards the largest stratification that is being played out under the pretext of birds of a feather flocking together. Here, formal knowledge and the vocational stratification it earmarks is but a sign of an even larger scheme of sco social status stratification in contemporary society. Doctors fraternizing only with other doctors, engineers fraternizing only with other, other engineers, is suggestive of such a rendering of our being. The gated community of today is thus but a sign of such a scheme of being, enforced by a ruthless and rootless logic of what it means to be a successful human being. This manner of lack of a common foundation is paradigmatic of contemporary educational progress, which as we have seen earlier in Polanyi's description of the achievement of Copernicus, is wrought out of a fundamental, sh fundamental shift in the affective principles that guide human coexistence. Uh, service, my next section is titled Service Learning, Experience and Emotion, Service Learning in the Context of Education. So, so far we have discussed the possibility of an alternate epistemology of learning. Uh, we have seen how the idea of knowledge as emotion, uh, knowing as emotionality, caters to notions of self-actualization that the psychologist Maslow had held as paradigmatic of human beings, of being human. We have also seen briefly, starting with Copernicus and culminating with my own personal experiences, the narrow manner in which formal education channels the affective structure of the human potential. Let us now proceed further by briefly surveying a few examples of non-formal educational practices and their contribution to the knowledge economy. Uh, we begin this exploration by taking a look at a youth civic engagement practice that is active in Gaza and the West Bank of Palestine since 2002. Uh, the Popular Achievement Program is a model of civic education or service learning developed by Humphrey Institute of Public Affairs in the University of Minnesota. The program is administered by coaches who are university students between the age of 18 to 24. These students are trained extensively for a period of 14 days to become facilitators of youth groups of children between the ages of 14 to 17 run for a period of seven months annually. Uh, members meet for about two to three hours a week. So in their essay, Learning by Doing, the experience of popular achievement in Palestine, Suzanne Hamad and Tariq Bakri uh, review the achievement of this program over the last couple of years. By harnessing team building exercises, group discussions, and role playing games, they, that reflect on the notions of the civic, the program fosters the free expression of opinion which occurs as trust develops within 
each youth group. The seven month learning process of problem identification, power mapping and action planning and doing has been flagged as one of the most important outcomes for individuals and groups involved. The authors credit the program for creating a special space that fosters experiences which are free from the domineering influences of adults and tradition. They also applaud the experiential mode which brings to life concepts which is most often encountered in the form of textbook definitions. Of interest to us is the manner in which the effective is mapped by in such practices. As involvement in this form of learning begins from the college student who work as facilitator, facilitators, it involves adolescents who form the action team and extends to the larger community of adults by virtue of the specific action goals chosen on the basis of the shared context. Uh, the experience of achieving specific goals such as setting up of a community library or a computer or sports room seem to have paved the way for the affective in the sense that they help in getting the larger community together. The festivals carried out to celebrate the success of the program in which the adult members of the community participated indicates the larger impact of such civic learning projects. This has contributed to the creation of complex network of relationships based on shared experiences, expertise, skills, creativity and wisdom. So notions of being someone and especially someone in relation to the community is a recurring theme in the testimonies of the coaches. They seem to suggest that both effect and affect are closely intertwined here as the effect of the project was not restricted to the goals that had been set up by each group. The blooming of affective relationships between the facilitator and those facilitated stemming from the non-intrusive, non-coercive and non-judgmental interaction are all suggestive of the alternative epistemology of knowledge that we have been exploring so far. In an interview to the executive director of change, uh, Robert Coles once again discusses the role of the experience of community service plays in the ethical and moral development of students as well as professors. He frames community service in terms of a moral and psychological antidote to competitiveness and greedy self-assertion which he sees only as articulating one aspect of human nature. Uh, though he does not restrict any such, uh, such service to any particular age group, he does claim that the intersection between high school and college to be an important starting point as it is here that one can anticipate the development of class divisions. Coles posits a number of projects that he can foster learning through service. So working on environmental, ecological projects, working with children, the elderly, at nursing homes, working at prisons, etc. Any domain which requires the energy and intelligence of young people who can provide intellectual, emotional and moral support seems apt for carrying out such service projects. He posits such projects as supporting two-way knowledge process as he sees service as a mutual process which involves both helping and being helped. Speaking of such forms of learning, he claims, I quote, educationally because I think it is a tremendous way for students to learn sociology, anthropology, psychology, social ethics, and in a sense to learn about others and about themselves in the most effective way I know. Uh, so, uh, my last section, I speak of sports uh, and knowledge that is, or knowing that is facilitated by sports. And in this regard, it's important, uh, the muscular Christian movement is one important thing that you will note because it reintroduced care of the body as an important uh, religious imperative. And then I move on to a paper on Women and Sports Extending the Limits of Physical Expression by Padma Prakash. And uh, while the paper traces uh, or, or has a feminist angle to it, which like refutes a lot of the myths associated with women, um, for me, like the crucial aspect of what she has to say uh, is that modern sports provide for women an alternative form of expression, leisure and enjoyment and acknowledging the heritage of folk dances and having fulfilled this need in the past in India, Prakash urges that, I claim, we must recognize that dance may not be everybody's choice of communicating or giving, giving expression to emotion. So the sports in that sense become a place of expression and that expression is associated with self-knowledge. Um, so in, I also have another paper where uh, we look at the sport of bowling as an ephemeral role. And uh, Steele and Zercher here indicate four psychological and six social functions of sports. So drawing on a number of sources, they, they list preparation for life, catharsis of socially unapproved drives in a socially acceptable manner, relaxation and recreation and identity generation, reinforcement and expression, 
as four psychological functions of sport, while affi affiliation, socialization, um, status and prestige needs, occupational needs, fulfilling the wishes of the others, and the separation from dominant roles and significant others are listed as social functions. And the last example I have from sports comes from the um, sport of windsurfing. And so what I'd like to po point out specifically about learning in, in this context is learning seems to be something which is very tactile, and it's a part of what uh, Merleau Ponty has called the intentional arc. For a windsurfer, what is knowledge is the minute mani manipulations he makes on the board or on his body to send his craft in a particular direction. So how this is associated with knowing and knowing about the self is because the whole experience of those bodily interactions of uh, letting the wind carry over water gives person a certain kind of rush, a certain kind of experience of freedom. And that grounds a certain knowledge of the self. So that is the aspect in which I introduced sport. So I conclude by saying that though such forms of facilitating learning through incidental means still do not exist, still do exist and are pursued across the world, such experiences are receding into the shadow of the rush that is fostered in contemporary cultures. The dominating means to an end approach has cast its shadow across such alternate experiences of learning that such activities are pursued only if there are tangible benefits available for the participant. The package deliverable that formal education caters to now is endemic into other realms of contemporary lifestyle as well. One more factor, more than anything else that has contributed to this subtle overshadowing is the contemporary phenomenon of the time crunch. Um, there ex exists a vast literature which documents this event, including what the Japanese refer to as karoshi, which literally means work to death. Uh, this is a phenomenon that one experiences when one visits most urban centers. Most people don't seem to have the time or luxury to pursue leisure activities that seemingly reflect a sense of self outside the immediate ambit of their vocations. While critics may point out certain individuals as pursuing such ends, often they are exceptional individuals. What needs to be taken into consideration here is the lack of a universal imperative in delivering such learning experiences across the spectrum. This paper thus urges us to reconsider the dominant manner in which learning is framed, and especially the treatment it dishes out about the affective or non-cognitive aspects that often remain invisible within the realm of formal knowledge. Acknowledgement of such factors can assist us in better understanding the process of teaching and learning and the gap that exists between the two. Thank you. Well, um, th thank you very much, Avino. Um, it was a very sympathetic um, exploration of what might be called education of sensibility, I think. And I'd just like to ask you briefly um, a question about the, what, what you said about the Vermeer painting. Um, now, clearly, um, in a painting, particularly um, a captivating painting like that, um, there is knowledge, experience of a non-linguistic, non-discursive sort, although I wouldn't myself call it non-cognitive. But the problem is, which you've touched on, which is, of course, the most profound problem in this area, is to say, to say <laughs> what is in paint, what does this picture tell us? Now, I will say some things about what that picture tells us. Um, it tells us um, about this girl standing at her in musical instrument. So she's playing music. But it's music as order, music as domestic, music as calming, something to be attended to, to be studied, and to enjoy the grace and possibly the nobility of it. And I think that, and you see the light coming from behind her left shoulder, possibly her, the light of inspiration, possibly something else. And actually, I think in that painting on the wall behind her, there is a painting that Vermeer owned, which is a rather sinister painting, which is obviously contrasting with this ideal domestic setting. Now, I can tell you all that. Um, but to experience the painting gives you a sense of the um, desirability of this. Now, somebody might not have thought of you know, a girl, ordinary looking girl, playing a virginal in a Dutch interior. Um, you know, what, what could that tell us? But Vermeer says 
it tells us all these things about possibilities and ideal existences through the experience we have of it. And so he expands my, our sensibility in doing that. Now the question I want to ask you is, um, of course the ancient Greeks were very aware of this, and that was why, as I said this morning, that was a basic part of their education. But the ancient Greeks said that Plato and Aristotle both, in fact, Plato more markedly, but it's also in Aristotle, said that only certain ideal types of art should be admitted into education. Because, of course, they knew that art was capable of um, encouraging vice, disorder, um, cruelty, all kinds of things like that. So, if you see um, art, I think quite rightly, as, as part of education and education of sensibility, education of the emotions. Um, do you think, do you agree with the Greeks and actually with Nietzsche who thought certain types of music should be banned? Or banned from school, anyway. Um, yeah, children should not be allowed to listen to Wagner. Um, <laughs> for the purposes, I uh, deployed... For the, for the purposes that I had yes. deployed this uh, that category of analysis was just to indicate the mode of learning. For my project for me here is to sketch out the mode of learning. So the ethical issues of whether you can show certain art or wooden art. Of course, I might be contextually like, I might take a stance and say, okay, this painting can be shown or this painting can't be shown educationally. Uh, but that has not been the scope of my paper. It's just to just, you know, sketch out, like I said, just draw out what is this mode of knowing in art. Yeah. I think you did it very yeah. Well. Yeah, so, yeah, so I rest my case. But I just wanted to know if it had educational consequences other than, than the art should be part of education. Right, let's have some other questions. Yes, yes, there. Yeah, you have used the term self-actualization in your research paper, right? And that very word is leading to so many aspects. You have touched science of kinesics. Uh, it's about growth, motivation, right? Uh, and somewhere you touched about truth. Ultimately, where that very term is leading to, I'm a little bit confused. What is your ultimate essence? Uh, see, when I've used truth in this, I've, I was quoting Rorty, and Rorty an idea that it should be towards uh, consensus and struggle towards consensus and not towards truth. So that's one aspect I have to clear out. And the way I use self-actualization, so here when I talk about leisure, like uh, I've, I've been thinking about useful and useless, and how the useless, like when I was speaking of Karoshi, like work to death, and I, I meet my friends in Bangalore who are always busy with work, and they only have a small time. So my question is, where's the place of leisure in self-actualization? And so I would like take the example of uh, activity like windsurfing, or like for, to make it simple, I love riding the motorcycle. And so when I'm riding the motorcycle and going for a long drive sometimes, I have a deeply satisfying experience. So I'm just highlighting these kind of experiences in the non-formal sector which provide personal knowledge and which um, grounds a sense of self and relationship with others as well because you have biking clubs then and then you have, you have sharing going on. Like That's if I've answered your question. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you mentioned uh, non-linguistic forms of knowing and silence and um, taciturn, being taciturn as part of those. Uh, it strikes me that while many cultures do valorize it in um, many languages in India, uh, the, the term mitabhashi, one who speaks little, is considered a positive thing to be. It strikes me, however, that one um, is, probably should be mindful of uh, the many roles that silence plays um, in ac across the world as um, uh, feminist scholarship and women's writing the world over shows silence there means uh, and or silence of uh, lower caste uh, uh, people in India in the Indian context shows uh, the, these non-linguistic forms of knowing have very different meanings uh, in very different contexts in various contexts. Thank you. 
Yes, yes. Oh, no, sorry, answer that. Yes. Uh, is that a comment or a question? Um, so, uh, yeah, it is very contextual. So that's why when I'm talking about art also, uh, quoting Bath about how human beings are also contexts yoked together. And even the American Indian discussions, you see in different contexts it means different things. Uh, so even in a classroom, if a person is doodling, he might be listening to you. But when we approach it from a like, you know, a straightforward way of accepting, he's doodling, he's not listening to you. So, yeah, but we have to be subtle to these kind of forms of learning, which, which is what I was trying to make a point for, that although language in the way, so it's, it's about measurables and how language captures measurables and delivers measurables in education. But it's also about these measurables coming to life in the classroom and the process of translation, if I can use that word. So we need to be sensitive in different situations how this works and how this, the emotional is attached to this in a large way. So that's my point, thanks. Yeah. Uh one of your slides, uh, there was one point mentioned about when you said uh, knowledge as a search for consensus and not as a search for truth. Uh, that actually, I was just wondering whether because I, I thought that I missed some point before that. So I was just seeking one clarification from you because see if you uh, define knowledge as a search for consensus among one particular community as opposed to others which have kind of a different consensus. So, and then what could be the boundary for dialogue between two communities? Suppose that one particular community can form one set of consensus and they could proclaim that this is our knowledge and this actually does not require truthfulness of this knowledge claims. This is our knowledge because we have, a, we have reached to this through consensus. And another community might claim the same kind of a consensus might be that that might oppose it to that consensus. So what could be the kind of then, and then the, the, there is no truth in that sense. So is there kind of a di uh, possibility for dialogue between the two communities or the kind of a rival consensus? Or, and then if, if they know, then, then there is no point of kind of a having consensus because consensus might be completely false. Um, so the context in which I quote that paper, it's, it's an interesting paper, it's called when, jan when janitors dare to become scholars, a betweeners view of the politics of knowledge production. And uh, so they're, they're at, the people who are writing it are too, uh, like he used to be a janitor, and like he's questioning the knowledge production, like when, when you are in knowledge production, there are a lot of uh, rigorous treatments that you need to have in, in terms of truth, this kind of rigor, rigor of truth, and knowledge production is associated. And he's claiming that Instead of doing that, and when he was talking about knowledge as being walking through the slums comfortably, okay, or uh, taking to the cane, talking to the cane workers, talking to the football players, he's talking about that kind of a relational social knowledge instead of like a theorizing which is from the above, which is has more in, invested in the notions of truth. Am I making myself kind of clear? That, that, so that is the kind of distinction I'm trying to bring out here. Thanks very much for your paper. I'm kind of interested also in um, a lot of the examples you gave, particularly around the art-based examples, are about almost like cultivating a certain kind of sensibility around sort of positive features. So, you know, the, the windsurfing, you know, gave you a sense of freedom and, you know, some of the, exa the, the, the way in which you talked about the Vermeer piece. But a lot of contemporary art practice, of course, is, is very much based on not uh, making you feeling discomfort, discomfort, uh, uncomfortable and dis, you know, filled with disease. And it challenges our so social sort of patterns of you know, interrelationships and how power actually operates in society and that kind of thing. And so whether you're looking at an installation or a community-based art project, I mean, these kinds of art-based forms of knowledge actually are about disturbing uh, our conventional ways of doing things. And I was wondering if you could say a little bit about that and how you're thinking about that within your project of sensibility. Um, it's, it's also the context. So if I now take the context of environmental education or the environment, and then we are doing this kind of violence on nature, then the kind of projects you're talking about directly add to the effect. You know, it, if you're talking about a certain kind of catharsis, even negative catharsis is catharsis in some sense. 
so i i don't would, wouldn't take on a, like the positive aspect or a negative aspect so if an artwork really provokes you if modern culture itself is seen as this kind of a attack on nature then it's very very useful to use that kind of shocking uh, art so you especially the gender question we have a lot of feminist art which usually shocks the person out of uh, normal conceptualizations that they have and uh, i feel that's a fairly reasonable manner in which to proceed uh, if i have understood your question properly yeah, yeah? i think maybe the last question rohit right at the back sorry yeah thank you for a very interesting paper i have one comment and one question and two formulations of the same question uh, when when i heard your paper i somehow got a uh, suspicious disquiet that knowledge perhaps is being rated too high and to call everything knowledge we are devaluing other modes of experience feeling bonding living and various kinds of very valuable things in human life we want to call all of them knowledge because knowledge is something which is glittering and very high it seems we are devaluing these things in this manner but that is a comment you need not respond but i would like to build consensus on the uh, on the claim that mahabharata war was fought by nuclear weapons and i will make endless efforts to to make to arrive at consensus in this because this i think would be an act of generating knowledge in india at this moment which is very valuable another formulation of the same question is language is enjoyment of well organized notes of sound and not thinking and communicating with words suppose i take this thing and then i try to prove that language is to be enjoyed and there is nothing to be communicated in this would you accept this argument uh i'm <laughs> yeah um yeah i i i'll take this up with you maybe later actually i think there was one more person trying to ask a question yeah if you be very brief i think we just given that rohit has refused to have it all for silent <laughs> Thank you. I'll, I'll try and be quick. Um, I'm very interested in, in the, the question of transmission in, in education, in particular, in particular, you know, that teachers transmit something um, non-verbally. And, and in, in, a, in the certain traditions, I, I think of Sri Ramana Maharshi, for example, there's a conception, Ramana Maharshi, and, and the conception of transmission of, of knowledge in a direct sense, uh, an explicitly if that's not a contradiction explicitly nonverbal um and where might that fit in because there should be a tradition that no doubt is a tradition of of nonverbal uh, transmissions um see uh, i i cannot comment on the uh, discipline like Ram, ramana maharishi's but uh, what i can gain from my experience is there are certain things that i have learned from my father almost like unknowingly okay and it's only later on when i come back in life that i reflect that oh i am like my father in this way so there is a kind of transmission but this is what ramana maharishi may be talking about specific transmissions so i don't know the nature or the breadth of what is being transmitted in that sense it is uh, something related to my emotion something to my attitude which i pick up from my father but i cannot comment on the spiritual side of it because i have no knowledge of it thank you